right now, um, I want to thank Don uh, for. <clears throat> can't remember what came. Out. Um, I want to thank Don for the invitation to come. I think he probably was um, prompted a little bit by David Schlesinger and Ingrid Olson, um, who have heard me um, uh, hold forth at the dinner table about this subject matter. So. Um, I've been teaching the history of sexuality for, well, well, I'm still teaching it on you know, a part-time basis at OSU, but I started teaching it in 1984. And at that time, it wasn't a field yet. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were maybe half a dozen college courses being offered on the subject uh, in the United States universities. And <clears throat> eventually, a couple of English universities picked it up, a couple of British universities, and then after that, it spread more widely, and it's now being taught globally. Now, initially, I wasn't sure that there would be a lot of interest in global history of sexuality, and besides that, there was, there was hardly any source material. And so, <clears throat> I started teaching the history of Western sexuality from the Greeks to the present, and got some primary sources and some secondary sources and put together a reader, I mean, put together a kind of a mimeograph reader, uh, that's what we used to do in the old days when we had a specialty course, uh, because there wasn't a textbook for it. And eventually realized that there was a market for a textbook, and so I was encouraged to put together a textbook, which I did. I've got a picture of it here, and this is, this is the book itself, and it's a series of readings put together from primary and secondary sources on the history of sexuality from the Greeks to the present. <clears throat> and it covers not in all the kind of detail one would want, but a great deal of detail. It's a 500 page book, so that, there's a lot of material in there. It's pretty, that's good and still fairly relevant material. I mean, the history of sexuality has uh, advanced so quickly, just in the last, uh, well, since I did this book in 1999, that I can honestly say that, um, that there have been extraordinary strides and lots of interest and a great deal of um, popularity of the teaching of the course. Now, I always say, <clears throat> when I teach it to students, that this is an X-rated course, and I, was, I said to Don beforehand, it could be that uh, some people will come and bring their children thinking that you know, this is an okay thing to do, and I, I, I see that hasn't happened here. <clears throat> this looks like a crowd that's going to be able to handle this material. <clears throat> uh, Teaching it over the years, I've seen some really interesting changes. And some of you, um, I know some academics in this audience and will appreciate some of this. And of course, there were um, more men than women in college when I started teaching in, the, in 1969. And that was reflected in the ratio of uh, male to female students that I had in class in those years, starting in 1984. And there might have been two or three women in the class, and the men came in, you know, they were. They knew what they were doing. They knew all about sexuality. They didn't, you know, I, I could maybe teach them a little bit, but not all that much. And uh, as it turns out, the women were very quiet and the males dominated the conversation. Well, when I teach a class now, I get a couple of very brave guys, <laughs> and the rest of them are women. Now, what's going on here? Well, the fact is that word gets around that the history of sexuality is a story of 2,000 years of males behaving badly. <laughs> and the result is that not too many men are keen on sitting there with a bunch of uh, very highly educated and um, uh, show feminist uh, 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 fellow female students uh, who have very strong views on some of these issues and uh, have well rehearsed them. So I have definitely seen a change over the years. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things about, I'm going to say, make some general points about the discipline, about the field of history of sexuality. And then uh, I'll give you some examples, as many as I have time for. Uh, I'm, I'm giving myself a little break here in terms of how much time I have. Uh, as many, many examples as I can, as I can manage um, in the time I have, I have left to sort of illustrate how these general points I'm going to make actually work in terms of historical interpretation. So what is sexuality a history of? Well, I think probably most people throughout most of human history have thought it had to do with bodies, male bodies and female bodies. And it's easy to understand why people thought this. 
it was easy to understand that people didn't think that sexuality had a history because of this particular focus on bodies. Um, bodies seem like a kind of domain of eternal repetition, and human reproduction is the, is the consequence of male bodies reproducing the female bodies. Uh, but the fact is that if you just look at that, you're going to miss a great deal of what sexuality is about, what the history of sexuality is about. Um, first of all, why do you suppose people thought that it was all about bodies and there was nothing else involved? I mean, after all, all you do is look around and you realize there's lots of sexual variation, that there was regulation of sexuality. People talked about it constantly or didn't talk about it, depending on what kind of culture and what kind of historical period you were in. But the fact is that human societies, from the beginning of human evolution, have had to survive. And the only way you can survive is to reproduce. And when times are bad, when there's a drought, or there's a shortage of food stuff, you don't reproduce. And when times are good, you do reproduce. People understood this. Communities understood it. There's a whole folklore, folklore about it. And individual families understood this, this reasoning. So it's easy to understand why it is that um, heterosex, what we now call heterosexuality, was the norm. That was the biological basis and foundation of human reproduction and therefore of human survival. And so it was a necessary combination. And there was the idea of having uh, some kind of intermediaries or some variation in maleness or femaleness was disapproved of. I mean, obviously there were examples of it. These, these examples were, in fact, disapproved of and sometimes repressed. So sex, in effect, male sex and female sex, subsumed, up until very recent historical times, what we now call gender and what we now call sexuality. In other words, sexuality was heterosexual desire for the opposite sex. I mean, opposite sex is a term that was always used and still is used occasionally, right? And, and it, it literally stood for what we now talk about as gender and sexual orientation, right? It was subsumed into that. A male wanted to have intercourse with a female, desired females, and he presented himself with society as a male, right? But if you look at the language, which of course is a kind of cultural history. Here's what you see. <clears throat> you have sex, the word sex, which has been around in almost every vocabulary, almost every language throughout history. And you have, so that's, that's thousands of years old, as old as language itself. And then you have sexuality, which is a word which is relatively recent. Um, Sexuality is a word that was probably used for the first time in the 18, early 1880s. And until you had the word sexuality coined and something to attribute to it in, in the world, you couldn't have homosexuality, you couldn't have heterosexuality, you couldn't have bisexuality or asexuality. And it was roughly the same time in the 1880s that all the sexual perversions, that's to say deviations from the norm, the reproductive norm, were invented fetishism and masochism, sadism, all the rest of it, they didn't exist before. So the question, of course, is, and this is something for the epistemologists, if there was not a word for it, did it exist? <laughs> right? In other words, don't you need words and don't you need concepts in order to understand what a thing is or what you are if we're talking about personal identity? So I mean, it makes you think. Now, scientists are working very hard to try to figure out more about the biological foundations both of sex, and sexual development, and of gender and gender identity. They're working very hard to find that out. And maybe they'll someday lock it all up and uh, figure out exactly what genetic structure, what notion of the, of the rate of hormone development, exposure to hormones in the, in the, in the uh, womb, and so on and so forth, determines outcomes, gender outcomes, and sex outcomes. And they'll understand that completely, and they're working on it. But even if they do do that, there's still a lot that the discipline, that the field of history of sexuality can explain. And it constitutes 
greatest amount of material that we work with in this, in this field. And I'll give you some example of these, and I hope that my examples that I give later, I'll give you the themes, and I hope the examples that I give later will shed light on how these actually worked in certain historical circumstances. All right, first, um, history can explain the changing religious and ethical prescriptions that have existed in all societies in all times about sexuality, sexual behavior. Even though the word didn't exist yet, it had to do with how people relate to one another sexually. Second, um, the evolution of law and the regulation of sexuality. So there's a whole legal regime that involves, uh, uh, that involves uh, statutory regulation of sexual behavior. Uh, it covers everything historically from cross-dressing to you name it and um, proposed prison sentences and so on and so forth. And we're still living in that regime. We have our own laws. It's just that they're a little uh, more relaxed and uh, freer than they used to be. Then you talk, you talk about sexual revolutions. Sexual revolutions involve politics, they involve culture, and they involve civil rights. And we're still on the tail end of one of the biggest sexual revolutions, uh, probably in the history of uh, Western history. Uh, although there have been earlier ones, uh, probably uh, almost as important, and one of them I'm gonna talk about shortly. Uh, so sexual revolutions change the rules of, on the ground, and they change them sometimes very, very quickly. And so those of you who are old enough to remember the sexual revolution in America uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, and into the 70s, have some idea what I'm talking about. Then there's a the changing outlook of medicine, and medical authorities. Medical authorities, as it, turned out, as it turns out, are the ones who are <coughs> responsible for, or think themselves responsible for, demarcating pathology from norm. In other words, what is a deviation and what is normal in terms of a biological or medical norm. And medicine, medical authorities have had growing prestige in the period since about certainly from the late uh, 19th century on, and have had an extraordinary role in, <coughs> in influencing what it is all of us think about what is normal and what is not normal. So you'll hear a little bit about that today as well. Then there are changing sexual practices, what people do when they get up to things in bed or outside of bed or wherever. And these are often very closely related, as it turns out, to marriage practices. As you know, many of you know, uh, now fewer than 50% of people who live in some form of partnership in this country are actually married. And so um, people tend to live together in a much more sort of uh, less formal way than they used to. And this has an enormous effect on the kind of sexuality that they practice, on the kind of sexual practices generally. So these has, this has to be factored in. Then we talk about, we talk about changing gender and sexual identities. And this, again, has something to do with the body, but it also has something to do with how people think about their bodies. Who am I? What is my identity? And all these kinds of notions are relatively modern notions. Uh, finally, there are changes in sexual orientation and sexual desire. I'm gonna talk about one of those cases right now. I mean, huge changes that take place over a period of 20 or 30 years, a uh, kind of a revolution in sexual orientation. And uh, we'll see, um, I'll give you a, try to give you an example of that and explain how that actually works. Changes in medical and scientific technology, which directly intervene in the sex lives and the, 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 the gender appearances of individuals. Uh, we're talking about surgery, we're talking about drugs, and we're talking about genetics, gene splicing, and all the rest of that sort of thing that actually allows medical people to intervene in bodies to achieve a certain kind of outcome. <clears throat> then there's the impact of major historical events. Wars, depressions, and modern ideologies of one kind or another. And these things have an enormous influence because wars and depressions tend to strengthen and demarcate gender norms and make them more distinct. There's less mixing, less tolerance for in-between states in, the, in these kinds of circumstances and situations. And finally, the fact is 
start having changes in bodies themselves. Since the beginning of human evolution, huge changes. Changes in size, changes in um, vitality, changes in health, uh, changes in longevity. And we have now got the technologies to fashion bodies, change our bodies, to intervene and give them hormones, and so-called hormone therapy. And we can, we can remain youthful, we can make, remain sexually vigorous longer than we would normally do, and so on. So all these things are part of what the historic sexuality does. There you go. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with talking about the Greek and Roman sexual system. Very different from ours today. But maybe not so different from the sexual systems that um, existed in most of Western civilization up until maybe, eh, you know, 100 years ago. Right, so <clears throat> the Greek and Roman sexual systems were based entirely upon power, concepts of power. And the people who had the power in ancient Greece and Rome were patriarchs, fathers, male citizens. And the people under them were virtually everybody else. Women, immature boys and girls, and slaves. These were slave societies. And <clears throat> these also, these patriarchal societies also governed themselves with patrilineality. In other words, it was absolutely crucial to these early, these ancient societies that property be passed down from father to son. And this was, I mean, blood was all in these, in these, uh, in these uh, kinship relations um, were all based on blood. And the result was that you had to make sure that you had uh, a fertile wife, and you yourself had to be fertile. And you had to make very sure that nobody else fertilized your wife. So ancient Greece and Rome uh, did not allow their women a great deal of personal liberty. In fact, they were segregated um, in uh, special places, uh, and no one was uh, permitted, no other male was permitted entry to these places. So it was extremely important. So we know that reproduction was an extremely important thing indeed. <clears throat> and the key in terms of the sexual system is, uh, if you think of it this way, is, is who gets to penetrate whom. The people at the top of the social and order, the elites, the male adult citizens, had the right to penetrate anybody they wanted except other adult male citizens. In other words, they could penetrate boys, little girls, they could penetrate the women, any women they could get their hands on, they could penetrate slaves. When I say penetrate, I actually mean that literally. They were the penetrators. They never permitted themselves to be penetrated. This was, this is something we see again and again. There's lots of documentation on this, and um, it's pretty clear that this was the, the, the standard notion of the way which people visualized hierarchy in terms of sexual relationships. Now. What's interesting about this is if you look at this picture, this is a young, a young man, uh, got the body of a, maybe a late adolescent. But if you look closely at his genitals, if you can see them all, tiny, tiny. Now, what's this about? Why are the genitals so small? Well, if you look closely, you see, not a bad, Testicle sac, pretty good size, and that indicates the extent to which, when males looked upon other males, they judged them for their potential to be fathers and, and you know, therefore citizens and uh, reproduce. But this, we still got that small penis, and how do we figure that out? If we saw, when we see, I know that none of you ever look at pornography, but if you did look at pornography, how are male penises represented today? Like this? Bigger the better, okay? So we've changed our whole conception of what the male penis, what, what, is, what is the desirable about a male penis, right? Well, the reason why this is a small penis is because this is an idealized, idealized notion of a pre-adolescent boy, which was one of the most desirable things for an adult male in ancient Greek and Roman society. Um, very often, um, and this is called pederasty. 
have different use of the term God. This is a perversion in our culture. But then it was a way an older man, an older citizen, took under his wing a young boy with whom he was, or in whom he was erotically interested and educated him and taught him some of the basic things about how to get along in life. And this was all accepted. This was all accepted in Greek society. This is an okay thing. Sometimes the little boy got uh, penetrated, although not in a painful way because if he did it too immoderately or in a way that drew attention to the, 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 what was going on, uh, then the father would object that his boy was being misused by someone. So very often, most of the so-called penetration that took place with young boys was what was called intercrural sex, intercrural sex, which meant between the thighs, all right, not actually penetrating the anus. So, now this is an interesting thing because what do we say now about a married man who has a wife who gets her pregnant and presumably uh, has love relationships with her and also with a young boy? Is this person a homosexual? Is this person's sexual orientation one thing or another? Well, he can't say he's a bisexual either because he can't have a relationship with another adult male. He can't have this kind of relationship with an adult male because no adult male would permit himself to be penetrated by another man. Okay? So we have a relationship with young boys, we have a relationship with women, and all falls under the same rubric. It's called love. They didn't make a distinction between love for boys, love for women. Right. Otherwise, homoerotic bonds between men in ancient Greece and Rome were very strong, very strong. In other words, strong friendships, idealized friendships, um, whole uh, uh, legions and corps fighting together out of that kind of love for one another, but don't touch me. Right? So this is, this is the, the, usual, the, the unusual thing about um, Roman society. Women, there's a Greek statue of women. Genitals are just kind of little mounds, right? Uh, they're not on display. Greek artists, men who, who sculpted these statues, weren't even remotely interested in showing female genitalia because that wasn't what they were attracted to. And they knew that that's other, what other men weren't attracted to particularly. And so they, they're blunt and they're not. And these aren't, these aren't, these aren't uh, uh, societies that in fact are are strict about sexual regulation, our sexual rules and regulation. They don't, I mean, there's lots of stuff that goes on in Greek society, Roman society in particular. A picture uh, from Pompeii, uh, Roman, a Roman uh, uh, wall painting from Pompeii, and we saw there's lots of things, there's bordel scenes and that sort of thing that you see a great deal of. So these weren't, these weren't, uh, um, these weren't societies that were afraid of sex uh, in any way. In fact, they had very broadly broad expressions of sex within certain rules and regulations. All right, now, the real sexual evolution of our time, and I'm gonna move on to another subject now, is uh, Christianity. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Christianity, which is the thing probably that has marked Western civilization more than any other single revolution with respect to sexuality. <clears throat> The early Christians lived in little communities in a pagan world, a pagan world that went in for that kind of thing. And the early Christians thought that the second coming was right around the corner. It was going to happen in any day. Jesus was coming back. The first generation thought it, the second generation thought it, the third generation thought it. All the early apostles, Paul in particular, who was lived in various places in the Mediterranean, thought that the, uh, that the second coming was, was, was about to happen. In order to prepare yourself for the second coming, you have to discipline your body. You have to avoid sin or temptation. You certainly have to avoid sexual temptation under any circumstances. But not just that. You have to deny your body anything that gives it pleasure. Anything. And the reason for that is that with all the emphasis on salvation, spiritual side of human beings, the body was nothing. It was a despised thing that you dragged around uh, the world with you and that you did everything you could to, to, to repress 
all attention to all its desires, all your all your uh, your um, your sexual and sensual pleasures. So we see, obviously, there's not there's not a great deal of art that comes from this earlier period, Christian period. There's some, but not a lot. Of it. This is uh, this is from the early Renaissance, and you can see there's uh, the serpent, and there's a woman's head on the serpent. <laughs> So we have sex with the serpent, female, um, in order to show that it's the woman who is the source of temptation. It's the female serpent who whispers in Eve's ear, eat the apple, and she's just doing it there. And then, of course, what happens next is they get expelled from the garden. Eden, and she's covering herself. He's not covering himself, he's covering his face in shame because, um, because clearly they have violated a fundamental uh, rule if you eat at the tree of knowledge, or the, uh, the apple of knowledge, and they have broken God's rule. So, what happened is that several of these Christians went out and lived in the desert. And the people who were the most ardent in their belief, the first two or three hundred years of Christianity, went out and lived in the desert. St. Anthony, and many of you who are Catholics would know some of the, the desert saints. And um, one of them was Saint Sir John, Saint John Cassian, who lived uh, at the end of the fourth century, and he was the guy who actually wrote a whole series of he did a series of books that he wrote that became the basis and foundation from for all of the later European monastic life, the Benedictines, uh, the Franciscans, and the rest of them uh, took most of these rules and incorporated them into rules for monastic. And you can see here, it says, clear rule for self-control handed down by the fathers is this. Stop eating while still hungry, and do not continue until you are satisfied. Sounds like a diet book, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the important thing. No one whose stomach is full can fight mentally against the demon of unchastity. So there's a link between the drive of hunger and also a thirst, as a matter of fact, because they deprive themselves of water. Uh, and they, did, they deprived themselves of sleep, all the things that the body wanted, uh, and linked um, a lack of chastity to that. Our initial stomach struggle must therefore to gain control of our stomach and to bring our body into subjection, not only through fasting, but also through vigils, labors, etc. So, um, now, not everybody felt this way, or could feel this way. This was, this was for the rare individuals, the ones who went into monastic orders, nunneries and so on, and for the desert saints, and for some very ardent Christians. And we still see in Christianity several reflections of this business about fasting and self-denial. It still exists. Um, but if Christianity was going to survive, they had to convert the pagans, you know, the Gentiles, and they had to reproduce themselves. And so marriage became uh, fundamentally accepted by the Catholic Church reluctantly, very reluctantly. It took probably seven or eight hundred years for it to fully be accepted because of the extraordinary um, notion of the idea of asceticism which guided early Christianity. But uh, once it did get accepted, <clears throat> the idea was all sex would take place only within the marital bond. This would eliminate all the kinds of temptations that would take place, could take place under other circumstances and more broadly in society. So what you have are marriages, and you have strict rules and regulations. Um, medieval um, uh, fathers of the church spent a great deal of time talking about how many times a week, how many times a month rather you can have sex, and what kinds of positions you could do it in, and what the, what, what the women's, what about the woman's menstruation, which they took from Jewish law, um, could um, could you have sex during menses? And the answer was no, of course not, and so on. So that. All of sexuality became regulated by the church. There's no laws regulating it yet. Law regulating sexuality is, is a bit later in, in, in human history. But during this period of time, enormously regulated by the church. And of course, any other kind of sex was sodomy. Now, this is a word um, that still exists in, in Western legal terminology. And you can open the paper, your local paper, and you can see that so-and-so is brought up on charges of uh, sodomy, first degree, second degree, third degree sodomy. 
And of course, what this means is <clears throat> that this person has put, I'm, I'm saying that this is usually a male, of course, this person has put his penis somewhere we ought or he oughtn't to have put it, right? That means that he put it in the anus, in the mouth, some other body cavity if he could find one, um, and in fact, um, spread his seed somewhere other than in the proper vessel. And this is the original Christian enunciation of sodomy, is that it's the, the, the spreading of seed, the spilling of seed, somewhere other than in the vagina of your wife. Right? The rest of it is sodomy. All sodomy. And all, all condemned, all damned, venal sin, serious business, um, and uh, much supervised by by the church, and of course, we, we know from looking at confessionals, that is to say, the confessionals, which certainly in the 16th century became very, very uh, popular, and uh, any country priest would have his own confessional, and uh, uh, the confessional would tell him what to look out for, ask what kinds of questions to ask his parishioners about their sexual behavior, and uh, what to avoid and what to do. And, well, we know that these kinds of things were precisely the things that were forbidden. All right, so now move on to the next example. Oh, let me show you a couple of this nice picture. Can you see that? In the early, the early church fathers used to say, and there are several examples of this, that the, the holiest and most wonderful dream that a man who is trying to abstain from desire of any kind is to dream that someone came upon him in a dream at night and cut off his genitals. So if you had this dream, you were blessed. It wasn't probably so nice getting the genitals cut off, but there was a lot of it. Many examples of self castration that took place on a fairly regular basis amongst the most ardent of Christians. And this is a, a modern painting, which I, I dearly love. Uh, by a modern a Belgian painter, or late 19th century Belgian painter. This is St. Anthony, the, the most important desert saint. And there he is being surrounded by naked women um, who um, he's, he's being driven absolutely mad with the, with the fact that these women are tempting him so, so late. Okay, modern homosexual. Probably the best book. I think ever written in the history of sexuality. Uh, it was written a couple of years before my, my sexuality reader came out. So I was able to include some of this book, this book into it, um, by a guy named George Chauncey, he teaches at the University of Chicago. He wrote a really wonderful book, a sensational book. I would recommend to any of you. It's still in print, available in paperback. It's called Gay New York. Gay New York. It's not what you think it is. <clears throat> It covers the period, the sexual system in New York City, from the 1880s to about World War II. And what we find when we look at the early period, the period of the 1880s, 1890s, is that the Greek model of penetrator, penetrated, still exists. In other words, males penetrating something other than an adult male. Women, boys, um, immature boys, particularly, so that we still don't have a notion of sexual orientation. It doesn't exist yet. What we have is a notion of sexual system based on gender presentation. <coughs> so, and there's all kinds of incredible documentation and evidence for this. So. What do we call these people then if we don't call them homosexuals? Uh, the people who are being penetrated. Or for that matter, the people who are penetrated. And aren't they homosexuals too? Right? The answer is no, they're not. They have, there are all kinds of names for them and you can find if you, if you, if you really look closely at the social history of the period. And those wool, the, 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 the names for the adult male are wolves, wolf, he's a wolf. Um, straight, they call him straight. Well, they called them trade. The people who called them trade were the young male prostitutes. This is a picture of a couple of these guys in one of the big 
brothels, male brothels in New York City, 1880s. They called them trade because these were the guys that paid them. And of course, it was a port city. Guys, sailors would get off the boat, and these guys would be waiting on the docks, and they'd go off to a, a, an assignation somewhere, and they would sailors would penetrate the boys. Simple as that. Without, for that matter, thinking of themselves as homosexuals. Because their sexual orientation, if they had an opportunity, would be with women. It wasn't so easy to get access to women. Right? Coming off the boat, the sailor, come on. What kind of woman are you going to get? You're going to get a prostitute, maybe. But there's this boy. So, you know, what's the problem? No problem. And we know this for, for, for all kinds of reasons. So, what do we call the, the boys? Well, there are several names for them, too. They're called fairies. They're called pansies. They're called punks. Punks are the, the youngest of the boys. Um, or they were called queers, but the queers, this is, and this is a little bit, a little bit more complicated. Queers essentially were people who called themselves queer, or thought themselves queer, were usually adults who had homosexual inclinations, but didn't call themselves homosexuals yet, called themselves queers. Um, they weren't so open about their, about, about uh, effeminacy. The effeminacy wasn't their thing. They were masculine but they like men. So that category did exist, uh, Chelsea found out in the 1880s and 1890s. But the point is that there was no stigma for having sex with a boy in New York City. Even the police weren't particularly concerned about it in those days. Now about mid-1870s, the word homosexual first appeared. And of course, historians of sexuality will tell you that when a word appears for something, it's because the phenomenon is there, or has appeared, just appeared. The phenomenon appears, the phenomenon recognizes the word that it fits him or herself. And so what you have then is what's what epistemologists call dynamic nominalism, where the word creates the thing and the thing creates the word, there's a reciprocity between them. So it's kind of a self-recognition. Oh, is that what I am? In other words, if you don't know what you are, and there's not a word for you, or it's not a word that you identify with, this becomes a kind of an extremely important notion of, um, of personal identity. So, it appeared in the 1870s and entered medical lexicon in the 1890s, and quickly became uh, a term in the legal discourse, but there was another word that was also used, and that's inversion, or an invert. A person who was an invert or someone who had an inverted sense of sexual orientation. What we're talking about here is not talking about gender anymore. We're talking about sexual orientation. It's not about what you look like or what your partner looks like. It's what you desire. The emphasis then is on something inside you, something that you desire. Right now, <clears throat> how and why did this happen? What caused this thing to happen? Because the same thing was happening all over Western Europe, all over the United States, especially in urban areas. Something extremely important that helped facilitate this transition that I'm talking about from gender presentation as the, as the thing that governed the sexual system to sexual orientation. It's a pan, that's a pansy ball. Can I interrupt for one second? Sure. Unless you'd rather I wait until the end for a question, but you've got these sailors coming off the boats and they're having sex with these young men. Were there no prostitutes available? There were some. There were so, some. But they chose the boys over the men. They chose the boys over the men. Or over the women. Over the women. Many of them did, yeah. And, and we but, know it this, there, but it wasn't because of a preference or because they would consider the Of course it was for preference. Okay. So that's kind of where you're going now. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. All right, so this is a pansy ball. New York was a different place. Well, maybe it's getting to be more like it used to be, but um, this, is, this is one of the last pansy balls in the early 1920s. Um, people would usually took place in Harlem. Harlem, you see there are black musicians in the background, and um, these are all uh, men that we now call gay, uh, who just love dressing up as women and, and parade around and have wonderful dresses. And audiences come to see them. They dance, they have 
They do stuff that's like very entertaining. It was something that he did. Uh, all kinds of uh, balls and, and cotillions and that sort of thing that took place during this period of time in New York City. All right, so here's what changed things. Our industrialization, um, the modern office, the modern corporation, uh, the illumination of uh, the sort of concentration of agricultural, um, industrial agriculture, uh, and small farmers, the loss of small farms, and uh, the, uh, the loss of crafts and, and skilled labor, uh, those kinds of things uh, were increasingly under attack. And so what you have is, for men at least, a sense of a loss of autonomy, a sense of a loss of power and self-motivation, a sense of uh, no longer being your own man, so to speak, your own entrepreneurial character, but rather somebody who existed in a hierarchy of bosses and capital. Working in an office, white power, secretaries over here, working with women. Hmm. Something that men didn't typically do or hadn't done in previous generations. So, and these women are work typing up the stuff that these guys are doing, accounting or something, and they're typing it up. So here's the problem. What's the new masculinity? What's, how's a man express his masculinity under circumstances where he's out of control, where he get, gets paid a salary, where he's got a boss, where he works with women? What does he do? How does he become a man? How does he express his masculinity? Well, there's, there's one possibility. This is the first muscle man, the first Western muscle man who really made a living going to circuses and sideshows and that sort of thing. And then eventually, the big stage in New York and other big cities, he traveled all over the world. He's a German guy named Sandow, Eugene Sandow, very famous guy. And he would go and he'd lift heavy weights and that sort of thing. And this was the first historical example of a muscle man, of a kind of masculinity that emphasized physicality rather than self-reliance or autonomy or feeding your family or being self-supporting, that sort of thing. It's a much different kind of masculinity. And this emerged at exactly the same time that this office revolution was taking place. Some of you gentlemen may remember this. <laughs> Charles Atlas. Charles Atlas was the guy who cashed in on this um, muscle revolution that took place uh, in all throughout Western Europe and North America at the end of the 19th century. And this is a slightly later version from the 1920s, but I mean, I remember seeing this as a kid and thinking, God, do something. <laughs> I don't want to be picked on by somebody else. So there was this influence that was happening. But the most important thing that was happening at this time is that the men working in these offices under these whole different set of circumstances and situations wanted, above all, to distinguish themselves from the pharaohs. In other words, they wanted to be masculine, male, in ways that fairies and um, uh, pansies and queers were not. That is to say, people who presented themselves in a gendered way as effeminate. And one of the ways they would do this is to restrict themselves to heterosexual relations, or what we now call heterosexual relations. In other words, the shift in gender orientation, pardon me, pardon me, the shift in um, uh, sexual orientation took place at precisely this time. And all of a sudden, the word heterosexual appears. Boom, just like that. It was something to describe something that was happening already. And men described themselves, maybe as straight, which is a term that persisted and endures to this day, but maybe they called themselves heterosexuals. And the doctors were using these words, and the doctors were making a, a diagnostic and clinical exam uh, uh, comments about people on the basis of their sexual inclination and so on. So basically, sexual orientation gets invented at this time. And it happens everywhere. In addition to that, 
starting with World War I, you have a war, you have depression, you have another war. As I said, what this tends to do is to strengthen gender norms, right? even though the word gender has not yet been invented. I'm using it analytically to talk about the past. It strengthens gender norms, and the result of this was a new and completely uh, surprising uh, lack of tolerance for effeminate men, for, for pansies, and for fairies. Pansy balls stopped. Gay bars, what we now call gay bars, uh, pansy bars, what you call, whatever you call them then, were uh, broken, broken into, and uh, these people were wrapped up and put in jail and called degenerates. That was the word for them, they were degenerates. And so what we had was a policing of these people. And so if you were um, a man who liked other men and were a bit effeminate, you'd be very wise to sort of dress like the rest of the guys and keep your head down. And this is when the closet was invented. There was no closet before the turn of the century, the 20th century now. The closet was invented, it was a place you went to hide, a place you were discreet. If you had sexual relations with other men, you did it in the most discreet way possible. You weren't out to other people, whereas it's in New York in the 1870s and 1880s, was not, everybody just, I mean, you knew exactly what you were dealing with because it was no longer the case after. So we have standard heterosexual and homosexual um, categories uh, established after this period of time. So uh, the final thing I want to talk about is gender identity. <clears throat> so I've been using the word gender from time to time. Uh, the word doesn't exist yet. Well, it does as a category of language, but not the same thing applies to bodies. And this, some of you will know this story. The first it's not the first person who was a transsexual, but close. 1952, George Jorgensen becomes Christine Jorgensen. And she became a nightclub act. She was so good, so convincing. Uh, he, he had the operation, transsexual operation, um, in Germany, uh, pardon me, in, uh, in Denmark. Had his um, penis and, and testicles cut off, and. Uh, John made and took hormones. Well, th these weren't these were hormones that were extracted from horse urine. In fact, um, um, artificial hormones were sort of post World War II. I mean, a sort of fifties phenomenon. So it's a little bit later that artificial hormones could could actually be used to be synthesized in a, in a much broader way. And um, this is the first person. This person was a fearless and was out in public. Everybody knew about it. It was a big sensation. It was a huge sensation. Um, some plastic surgery, too, she had. So this was out there. So we have a transsexual person. This person didn't change gender. This person changed sex. Right? That's what the people said then. That's the term they used. That's the way they characterized it. And then, in the late 1950s, a man named John Money A man named John Money uh, established a clinic at um, Johns Hopkins with a doctor um, to deal with hermaphrodites, people who were born with ambiguous genitalia. That's what they were called until, until the 1950s, at which point intersex became the term that was used to characterize people born with ambiguous genitalia. And Money was a guy who was trying to help trying to do his best to help them. And so he said, what we need to do is to examine these young people at birth and perform a surgical operation on them if, it's, if, 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 if the genitalia are predominantly male, um, then um, we'll try to preserve that, right, as best we can, and eliminate the large labia or some other uh, female uh, genital um, organ. Or if it's predominantly female, you know, um, that's a little more problematic. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you have a little tiny penis, you can cut it off. And then just make a vagina. And that's the easiest thing to do. And that was something that was most often done. Probably 70% of ambiguous genitalia were turned into little girls. Um, I mean, genitally. 
what he said was that what we do is we make the operation one way or the other, we decide with the consultation with the parents, although the doctors have a lot more authority than probably with respect to parents than, than, to, than now. Our parents now uh, stand up for themselves and do research on the web and don't let themselves be pushed around by doctors so easily, but in those days you could, could do that. And then he would give careful instructions to the parents about how to raise the child and the gender of their new sex or of their clarified sex, right? He invented the term gender for this context. He's the guy who took a grammatical term and applied it to a person. And about three years later, no, about three, 10 years later, this guy, whoops, that's telling my age, sorry, I'm sure I'm that my age. And this is Robert Stoller, who was a UCLA psychiatrist and doctor and psychoanalyst who um, invented the term gender identity. And what he did was to incorporate, I mean, money believed that you could actually, by raising a person a certain way, you see, believed entirely in the power of environment. By raising a person a certain way, uh, they would turn out to be this gender or that gender. The sex was really not that important, right, as far as he was concerned. It was really who you thought of yourself as. And Robert Stoller said, well, you know, you not enough physiology in there, not enough um, uh, about uh, psychology as well, and not enough uh, understanding about how hormones actually functioned uh, in terms of sexual development to shape people's conceptions of themselves. So he said, we have to have some more of that. Well, in any case, the term gender stuck. And it's now, it stuck so well, as a matter of fact, that um, it's replacing liquid sex for all practical purposes in every way in which we distinguish between males and females. Now, you might ask yourself, what does, what does feminism have to do with this? Well, the answer is, hmm, feminists came along late 1960s, and they had all kinds of terms for women, and who women were in society. Um, uh, they called, it, they called um, what we call that now called gender, they called them sex class, or they called them sex roles. Women had sex roles, right? So they were women, but they had certain roles in society that enabled them to escape some narrow deterministically notion of what women, the sex of women should be, right? And so they invented, they saw this word came along, it looked really a nice word to, to be used, I think they grabbed it, and so gender became a feminist concept because it allowed you to unhook the notion of women's role in society from their sexual bodies, their sex bodies something that women have been waiting for about 1900 years for. Right? And um, a very important notion indeed. And then lastly, oh. there's Caitlin. <clears throat> and you all know about this because you've been reading about it. It's in fact impossible to, uh, to, not to ignore. Um, Caitlin Jenner has not had uh, genital surgery, but every other thing that can be done to move him into a her has happened, including scraping the larynx. He's taking the skin off here and scraping the larynx down so it's flat like a woman's. And um, the question is, will she have genital surgery and go the whole hog, so to speak, and turn herself? into a woman sexually as well. <clears throat> but she's not called a transsexual. She's called a transgender person. So and one of the things that we need to understand is that um, the whole operation to have um, the complete transsexual operation involving changing the genitals is now becoming increasingly unpopular. And the enormous numbers of people who regard themselves as trapped in the wrong body simply don't go through with the genital surgery anymore. And they live their lives with the genitals they were born with and with the gender presentation of the sex that they actually feel they are. Right? So, and that's becoming increasingly common. It's also very expensive surgery. It's also probably hurts like hell, I can imagine. <laughs> so, um, 
that's, those are the examples, the four examples I wanted to give you to show you how all these various historical factors that I mentioned at the beginning, changing ethical and religious prescriptions and, and medicine and all the rest of that, how that actually influences the ways in which um, changes in um, sexuality have occurred uh, over, the, over the centuries. So thank you very much. so committed anymore to being this or that. Um, they're quite willing to live in a kind of flexible um, environment and situation where sexual orientation is not absolutely crucial, and it's not the most important thing about them, and it's not, it's not permanent. It can change. It can be different tomorrow than it is today. And they're opening this, they believe this as an open possibility. And this is what I like to spring off more of the general bit. A term I keep hearing more and more, and I think with young people it's becoming quite common, is gender fluidity. Yeah. And um, exactly. whether or not you feel that that is perhaps the next revolution in sexuality is that we're not going to primarily define ourselves. Um, and also, just the whole cultural shift that's happened so rapidly, I think, towards the uh, society's attitudes towards homosexuality. For me, I think perhaps we're in a new evolution. No, it's, it's, it's stunning. Think about gay marriage as an example. Of it. so gender fluidity is an incredibly important notion now. And <clears throat> gay marriage looked like it was dead in the water 10 years ago. And look what's happened. Now, of course, we're waiting for the Supreme Court to um, <clears throat> tell us whether or not this is going to be OK. <laughs> but otherwise, um, 
it's, um, it's happened with extraordinary rapidity. A lot of that has to do, obviously, with the digital revolution, with new forms of communication, um, people, people in, in interacting with each other in ways that have, you know, was, was never possible before. Do you talk much in your classes about female sexuality? I, I'm reacting yeah, really I strongly to the male focus of this, but I'm just All curious. Right. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, here's the thing about female sexuality. First of all, the males didn't want to talk about it. And if a female was too assertive or too aggressive, then she was, and we all know the words for this, this kind of thing. I mean, she was uh, stepping out of line. She was not, she was not within the proper gender boundaries. Um, women learned early on how to maintain a certain discretion in the way in which they present themselves to the world, I think, historically. As far as, um, as far as women who were um, homosexual, or that is to say, not heterosexual, going way back, women always had ways of having private relationships that weren't as public and that people weren't as concerned about or threatened by as male homosexuality. In other words, if we go far enough back, we see that there, I mean, there have always been lesbians. And they have always been fairly discreet about how they behaved. Um, and the fact is that, uh, that when the gender revolution took place that I just spoke about with respect to New York in this period of time, lesbians suffered much the same fate as I mean, lesbian women who were out and about and in public and presenting themselves as lesbians with other women in public places were policed in the same way that the, that the gay men were policed in that same period of time. And it's, um, it's an extraordinary thing that if you read, and it's not just because there are more male homosexual scholars of sexuality than, than women, there are lots of women out there, and it's just that there's not as much information about it because the policing on men and the medical attention to men, another part of the sexism of Western society, that you have to worry more about them they're more of a threat if they deviate from the norm than women are. And um, there's the other matter <clears throat> that in every war you lose a substantial part of the male population. And there were lots and lots of women after World War I and World War II who were deprived of their husbands or their fiancés. And the end result was is that a lot of women ended up living together. And it's a great, it was kind of a very private and accepted notion of how it is women should get along in the world without a man. And they lived together, maybe they had sex, maybe they didn't, but female partnerships went up um, astronomically after both the big world wars in the 20th century. Any other questions? Yes. Are you familiar with Tyrone Hayes and his work on- Tyrone. Tyrone Hayes at Cal Berkeley, teaches biology, does research on, on atrazine, and its impact on amphibians, on the sexual yeah, expression sure. of amphibians. Are you familiar with that? I know, I know, I know a lot of that. I know about a lot of that work. The, the kinds of um, the kinds of things that influence sex development and and atrazine is, is a big one. Yeah, exactly. And, and so uh, Gen last, genital formation. Pardon? The formation of genitalia. Yes, and uh, behavioral expression yeah, exactly. too. Um, so th this last fall, I. I attended a seminar in which one presenter presented material very much like you've presented about the history of different kind of different expressions of sexuality, different orientations and so on. And, and it was all very, very uh, interesting and fascinating, and, you know. And then Tyrone Hayes presents his stuff about what atrazine does to amphibians, and even there's some implication that it has impact on gender expression in, uh, sure, in sure. humans. Yeah. And so those two were just so opposed to the, the attitude of each was so opposed to each other. One seemed accepting of huge variations in, gen in uh, sexual expression, and another seemed to be sort of, you know, environmental chemicals do horrible things, yeah. like X, Y, and Z. Right. Um, look, there's, I'd like to think that there's going to be a kind of consensus between
scientific work on this. So like the phthalates, P-H-L-A-T-A-T-S, phthalates, have often also been linked to genital, to genital abnormalities and also possibly gender identity, which we, we call uh, developmental disorders and, and gender dysphoria. And there's no question that there are environmental problems, issues, things out there that actually influence um, sex development in, um, in a developing human being. There's no question about that. Um, but that's pretty new stuff. I mean, that's, we've, we've polluted our environment, and that's something that's happened in the last 7,500 years. Which, you know, because it's happening at the same time as the cultural changes that we have talked about and witnessed, it's kind of hard to separate one from another. So this is what, this is, this is all going to be sorted out, I think, in the long run. And lots of scientists are out there working on it right now. Anything else? So um, that's in fact um, a very good point, and I, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is that if you read uh, uh, Alfred Kinsey's two big books about male and female sexuality, 1940, 1940 and 1952, uh, I think that's right, 40 and 52, um, he talks about what people do before they get married as premarital sex. And kids today talk about hooking up. Um, it has nothing to do with marriage. It has nothing to do with courtship. It has nothing to do with what happens before you get married. It's what happens between the young people. You know, it just happens. And um, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. It's just, it's, it, 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 I've seen it gradually because I come in contact a lot with young people who talk about these issues, precisely these issues. Um, it's, it hasn't snuck up on me suddenly, so I've sort of seen it happen um, uh, by degrees. But it's, it's a huge change, and of course the point is that it used to be, I mean marriage was the big stepping point, and those of us who um, were young um, growing up after World War II uh, went through probably the most um, marriage-oriented and family-oriented in all of American history. In terms of the number of people who were married, living, cohabiting, and married at the same time, and who also had children, easily outdistanced any other period of time in American history. So there's no question that we were raised in a peculiar and very interesting uh, environment, and the world has changed very quickly um, since that time. And what we have now are young people who have sex just to have sex or have premarital, well, I mean, I'm falling into the same trap, but have, um, have sexual experiences with one another of all different kinds. Um, and don't think of it as premarital at all. In fact, it's just what you do, and you get some experience, and have some fun, and maybe fall in love, maybe fall out of love, and um, that's what counts. That's the main thing. It's not, I mean, as I said, half of couples cohabiting today are not married. And it's, it's continuing to go on more and more and more. So, you know, this is happening in Europe too. It's happening all over Western Europe as well. So, it's not unusual to America. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you for the very good question.